then I yeah would welcome everybody to tonight's um, ITS Early Career Scientist Seminar. We have again three speakers, and yeah, I directly introduce the first one, who is Jennifer Arthur. And she is a researcher in Antarctic glaciology and remote sensing at the Norwegian Polar Institute. And she uses satellite observations to study Antarctic ice shelf hydrology and dynamics. And today she will talk about subglacial lake detection in Drowning Mountland, East Antarctica using ice sat. Yeah, welcome. Thanks. Yeah, so thanks for having me to talk today. Um, yeah, as just mentioned, I work at the Norwegian Polar Institute and I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, detecting subglacial lakes in the coastal Drowning Mordland region of East Antarctica, um, primarily using ISAT2. So subglacial lakes are bodies of water under an ice mass um, and the map on the left shows the most current inventory of subglacial lakes around the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, and for a subglacial lake to exist, um, we need a low and basal hydraulic potential due to bedrock topographic depressions, warm basal conditions for the presence of liquid water, or the trapping of water beneath cold base ice. And there are two types of subglacial lakes, those that are active that periodically drain and refill, and those that are stable, which remain trapped in topographic and hydraulic potential depressions, more towards the ice sheet interior. And most active subglacial lakes have been reported under fast flowing ice streams. But the evolution of basal hydrology remains uh, quite a major uncertainty in future ice sheet dynamics. So understanding the dynamics of subglacial meltwater from the inland right through to the coast is um, something important that we still need to get a better picture of. Um, and satellite, uh, satellite repeat altimetry and also um, interferometric synthetic aperture radar and methods that can be used to detect surface expressions of these hydrologically active subglacial lakes as um, displacements of the ice surface. And we know from these methods that um, these active subglacial lakes can fill and drain on annual to decadal timescales uh, around Antarctica. So here you can see an example from the ISAT-2 satellite where elevation anomalies um, in the intersecting satellite tracks um, show in the lake at the bottom on the left there, the ice surface bulging um, in the brown colours, indicating that the lake's filling. And then the lake in, in the top right, um, in the blue colours, um, showing ice surface lowering, so indicating the lake draining. And we can use these methods to build up a more complete picture of where subglacial water is accumulating as lakes, um, and then filling and draining, and how it's flowing beneath the ice and the pathways that it's taking. So now I want to take you to the coastal Drowning Mordland region of East Antarctica, uh, where up until recently there hadn't really been any active subglacial lakes recorded, um, in the coastal region at least. Um, so here now we're in the upstream region of the Hjutalstraumen Glacier, which is a fast flowing ice stream that feeds the Fimbleisen ice shelf. And I think it's the largest uh, glacier draining this part of the ice sheet. So this is some recent work done by Nicholas Neckel and others at RV, and they found evidence for subglacial lakes here actively filling and draining. And they used the method called um, differential synthetic aperture radar interferometry using the Sentinel-1 uh, satellite data in interferometric um, wide swath mode, which has a swath width of 250 kilometers. And they used this to detect um, displacements in the ice surface to centimeter scale. Um, and then from this um, inferred a number of different active subglacial lakes. Um, and lake outlines with this method are detectable from um, bullseye patterns in the interferograms, like the grayscale example that you see um, in the center of the image that I'll come back to. And using this method, they recorded this uh, propagation of ice surface uplift and subsidence events um, downstream further towards uh, Yutta Straumann. Um, and you can see the outlines of the lakes um, moving through time and the, this kind of cascading drainage mark with the white arrow um, pointing to this um, routing of subglacial water along the beds following the hydraulic gradient towards the Jutlstrom and Gracia. So um, I'm saying a bit more about this uh, interferometry method. So 
when you have two overlapping interferograms covering different time periods, you can calculate, um, you, can dis you can difference them and then you can calculate the vertical displacement of the ice surface over these lakes. Um, an example of this is shown here on the right. Um, and as I mentioned about these bullseye patterns, you can identify um, the lake signatures or the ice surface displacement events um, in the interferograms from the differencing. And this shows ice surface deformation, which can then be converted to um, vertical displacement um, of the ice surface. Um, and the different fringes that you can see, the fringe patterns kind of corresponds to um, different amounts of displacement. And as they did, you can also compare um, ice surface displacement uh, signatures um, with uh, data from satellite altimetry, like the ISAT-2 satellite, which is what they did here. Um, so this is the plot that you see on the left, um, and it shows over the, this example, Lake Ice B, um, between the dashed lines on this plot, um, gradual uplift um, over the lake in this region since 2019. Um, both in the Sentinel-1 INSAR-derived uh, signal and also the ISAT-2 signal. So now I want to take you somewhere slightly further east in coastal joining moorland, um, just inland of the Lazarus ice shelf. Um, so we're here about 30 kilometres inland from the grounding line. The grounding line is marked by the bold black line. Uh, and again, we haven't really had any active subglacial lakes reported in this region to date in current inventories at least. Um, here ice is, is pretty slow flowing, um, about less than 20 metres per year. Um, and my colleague Guillermo Holt um, a while back detected evidence of a couple of small active subglacial lakes here from ISAT-1 satellite altimetry data in the early 2000s. So this is the predecessor to ISAT-2. Um, and here you can see data plotted from two intersecting ISAT-1 tracks um, and they're corresponding along track elevation profiles. So Lake 1 here is approximately five kilometres wide and Lake 2 is approximately two kilometres wide. Now, over this location, ice uh, thickness is around one kilometre thick um, and the bed elevation is nearly 560 metres below sea level um, and there's quite minimal ice surface slope. Um, but here now we're plotting um, these data as ice surface elevation anomalies as deviations from the mean. So this is showing that there was ice surface deformation of up to um, six metres over the largest lake with progressive um, ice surface lowering from uh, March 2004 to November 2008 and around two metres of lowering in the smaller lake. So this suggests that these two lakes were actively uh, draining over this time period. So we wanted to investigate this region uh, further using more recent and high resolution ISAT-2 data um, to see if the lake location could be confirmed with this more recent data and to build a, a longer time series of lake filling and draining activity. So we analyzed the ISAT-2 ATL-11 land ice height time series product, um, which provides slope corrected elevations every 60 centimetres along ISAT-2's reference ground tracks. Um, and the ISAT-2 satellite has a 91 day repeat orbit, so it's recording surface heights along each ground, ground track around four times a year. Um, and because the ATL-11 heights have already been corrected for offsets between the reference ground tracks and um, ATL-06 measurements, they can directly be used to derive elevation uh, change rate. So they're useful for this sort of work. So we used ISAT2 um, data from two intersecting tracks that you see in the map on the left. Um, and we found, um, we basically found surface elevation anomalies in the same location as uh, those that the ISAT1 lakes were, um, that I mentioned on the previous slide that are indicative of an actually filling and draining lake uh, between 2019 and 2022. Um, so the lake is around 40 kilometers squared and this estimate was derived from calculating the elevation difference um, between temporally adjacent time-stamped RIMA digital elevation model strips. And those are generated from images acquired by the Worldview 2 and 3 satellites in January 2020 and February 2021 over the time period that we detected ISAT-2 elevation anomalies. 
Um, the, the DEM differencing method is obviously limited by the, the time period covered by the DEM strips, which is dictated by the availability of the satellite overpass dates used to generate the strips. So it can't give as precise a window of the late filling or, or draining activity as other methods could, for example, with Sentinel-1. But it serves as quite a nice um, cross-validation of where we think subglacial lake locations might be. So looking at the data in a bit more detail, and the top two plots are showing uh, long track elevation profiles over these two, uh, these two tracks. Um, and then below that, you can see um, the data plotted as elevation anomalies um, over the same tracks. Um, and nicely, you can see that it shows um, elevation lowering, gradual, well, in increase to start with, but then gradual uh, elevation lowering over time, and um, like going from the blue colors through to the, these yellowy colors. Um, and the anomalies are calculated, calculated relative to the first cycle. Um, and the reason there are some gaps in this left-hand plot is we eliminated some uh, poor quality surface heights that might be caused by things like uh, cloud cover, uh, blowing snow, or like background photon clustering. Um, and there's a quality flag in the ISAT to this particular data product that allows to filtering out of that. We also conducted some hydraulic routing analysis. Um, if you look at the inset map here, um, by estimating hydraulic potential um, using REMA and bed machine um, and calculating um, potential locations in the hydraulic potential where subglacial water could accumulate. And then also, also estimating potential um, subglacial water routing pathways. So you can see um, with the lake outline here that it corresponds quite nicely to one of these kind of predicted um, pathways that the subglacial water might take, um, potentially suggesting that once the lake drains, um, water is being routed further downstream towards the grounding line and towards Lazarus Ice Shelf. Um, and if we look at the data as time series of these surface elevation anomalies, um, it clearly shows um, at the start of the time series, ice surface elevation um, bulging over where this lake is from mid-2019 through to early 2020, um, which we're interpreting as the lake filling, followed by uh, quite a long-term ice surface elevation lowering um, from early 2020 through to late 2021, um, which we're interpreting as the lake draining gradually. And then this kick up at the end um, is where we think the lake started to refill again at the end of 2022. So in summary, um, we've identified some new active subglacial lakes um, near the Lazarus Ice Shelf grounding line um, using ISAT-2 laser altimetry, and then also corroborated with um, REMA DEM strip differencing. Um, and from analyzing these ice um, surface heights in the ISAT-2 ATL-11 product, we've identified um, ice surface uplift and subsidence over this region between 2019 and 2022, um, indicating that the lake episodically drains and fills and potentially routes water towards the grounding line and, and the ice sheet margin. Also, um, just that um, in this INSAR method with uh, Sentinel-1, um, synthetic aperture radar is sensitive to small lake drainage events, um, like the work with um, Nicholas Nettle and others that I talked about at the beginning. Um, and it's, it's sensitive to these small lake drainage events, which might not necessarily be resolvable in laser altimetry. So using um, Sentinel-1 inside together with altimetry can potentially uncover uh, many more um, subglacial lakes, active subglacial lakes around Antarctica than are currently in, uh, in Antarctic wide lake inventories. In terms of next steps for future works with this, um, we want to do more further detailed analysis of ISAT to repeat passes together with Sentinel-1 INSA to get um, a better regional picture of um, active subglacial lake activity in this region and also um, do some estimates of drainage catchment size and water inflow um, to this lake and others um, from the upstream basin areas and get an idea of um, potential subglacial water flux in this region. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for listening and look forward to answering any questions later. Thank you very much for your nice talk. I yeah, um, really liked it. Mm. 
Okay, then, uh, yeah, we directly start with the next speaker and have questions as always in the end. Um, I also really appreciate the northern lights in your background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, next speaker is Naomi, if you can share the screen. I don't know if Jennifer needs to unshare before. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I seem to have lost the window. Um, does Jennifer have to stop sharing? Yeah, sorry. I also don't want to. Okay. Then, uh, yeah. Finish there. And in the meantime, I can already introduce her. So, um, yeah. Naomi is a PhD candidate at CEO Boulder, and she uses also remote sensing and field methods um, and modeling to study tidewater glaciers dynamics in Antarctica and icefall glacier um, processes in Alaska. And additionally, she also has a history of working with climate literacy outreach programs, um, such as aspiring girls expeditions, girls on rock expeditions at home, or also the Juno ice field research program. And um, yeah, welcome Naomi. Hi everyone, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I'm Naomi, and uh, today I'm going to tell you about a project that I've been working on and then some next steps that uh, are underway. So um, I will be talking about the Larsen B Fast Ice Breakup event in January 2022, and specifically on Hectoria Glacier's rapid retreat, which is kind of the uh, sneak peek at future research. So... Oh. There we go. Uh, we're going to zoom into Antarctica again, and this time talk about the coast. So ice shelves flank 75% uh, of the coast with an area of about 1.5 million square kilometers. And this figure that I'm showing you here is an indication of what the buttressing effect of these ice shelves have on upstream ice. So the yellow and brownish color means that they're buttressing the upstream glacier ice, and the blue is not so much. So this is just to say that ice shelves can play an important role in the stress and strain dynamics of the upstream ice. So if you lose them, significant things could happen. So that's exactly what happened in the Larsen B embayment in 2002. So we're going to zoom in on the peninsula and look at the Larsen B area. So it's had a pretty dynamic history. It broke up in 2002. And then the glaciers had a pretty significant response. They retreated, they thinned, they sped up, and there was open water during that period of time. But then in 2011, sea ice came into this embayment and it fastened to the shoreline and stayed there until January of 2022. But then it broke up again and the glaciers also had a response to this event. So my research is looking at these last two things, the fast ice breakup event and what the glaciers did this time. So this is a figure on the left side of what happened with the fast ice over the period of about two days. Rifts appeared, and then the next thing you know, the fast ice started drifting into the ocean. Now, what we wanted to know was what exactly caused this. Almost like a murder mystery, who done it imagine your favorite game of Clue kind of experience. So we evaluated probably about a dozen different data sets, which you can read about in my cryosphere discussions paper. But today I'm just going to talk about a few of the important ones. So what triggered the fast ice breakout event in January 2022? So one of the first things that we looked at was the temperature. So using ERA-5 data, we investigated whether or not this season, the November 2021 to January 2022 season, was anomalously warm. And if we look, there actually is 
pretty much a bullseye right in the Larson B area. So it was an anomalously warm season. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there was a lot of melt happening, which could have impacted the way that the fast ice broke up. So the next thing we looked at was whether or not there was a lot of melt. So we used um, AMSR data uh, to investigate the number of melt days in the spatial area of the melt over the course of the last decade. So there's a lot going on in this figure, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I just want to draw your attention to the dark blue and the dark magenta areas, because that's the time period from October until January of every year, 2012, until the 2021-2022 season. And if we look, there's not a big change in the last decade of a lot of melt. So it's not an anomalously melty season, so to speak. So it was probably not the primary driver of the breakout, but it could have played a role, I mean, as melt usually does. So then we are left with, well, then what's next? What could it be if it wasn't warm temperatures and it wasn't melt? Well, one of the anomalous things about this year of 2022 was that the sea ice concentration of the entire Waddell Sea was at a pretty low year. In fact, there was a corridor that opened up between the peninsula and the normal sea ice pack, which I have zoomed in on here, which means that things that are happening in the Atlantic Ocean, such as large swells, could potentially reach the fast ice for the first time in that decade. And there's been some research that has shown that ice shelves can be affected by big waves. Some of them can even break up because of it. And so that's what we wanted to look at next. Was it the waves that caused the fast ice to break out? And so we used wave action data from ERA-5 as well as WaveWatch to look for two specific things that have to align perfectly. And that's you need a large significant wave. So it has to be pretty high and it has to have a long period so that it can go like flex the ice, but like deeper into the ice. So if you look at this figure, we have blue and we have red. Now the blue color is the wave height and the red color is the peak period. And what we need is a peak of both of those things at the same time. So this is the month of January. The wave corridor that I mentioned in the last slide opened January 8th and the fast ice broke out around the 19th. And if we look, there is in fact a peak of the wave height and the peak period during that time. So that is to say that we found it. The ice shelf, or sorry, the fast ice broke up due to the wave uh, that had a high peak period and a high uh, significant wave height that likely caused the fracturing. And then it drifted out to sea probably because of foam winds, but you can read more about that in my paper. So that leads us to the next part. We figured out why it happened. So then what happened because of it? What are the consequences of such a thing? So how do the tributary glaciers respond in the immediate aftermath? So one of the things we looked at was velocity changes. We used Sentinel-1 data uh, to look at how the velocities changed over the last year. Now, this figure down below it shows the distance along the track of Crane Glacier and the speed in meters per year. Now, the blue lines, those are velocity measurements from before the fast ice broke out. So from 2020 and 2021 and January of 2022 prior to the breakout. And then the yellow to reddish brown is the gradient of time from um, April, of, well, I guess March of 2022 until March of 2023. So over the course of that year, speed increased at Crane Glacier by about 43%. Now, Green Glacier had a little bit more of a response. It increased by about 130%, going from about 400 meters per year to about 1,200 meters per year. Hectoria Glacier, now Hectoria Glacier is the one that I'm going to talk about a bit more, but it also had a huge increase in speed over that course of the year in both partially grounded areas as well as the grounded zone up um, high up above, high upstream, sorry. So the other key thing that we can look at with glacier dynamics after such an event is thinning. So Crane Glacier did not experience very much thinning as of yet. So we looked at these boxes in the uh, blue, orange, and red, 
and looked at data from 2017 until 2023 using both ISAT and Worldview DEMs. And we found that so far, there hasn't been a big thinning response. However, that is not the same for Hectoria Glacier. So that takes us to this deep dive at Hectoria. Now, this part has not been published in my paper yet. Well, some of it has, but this is the follow-up to this story of what's going on at the Larson B area. So Hectoria Glacier retreated about 25 kilometers during this period, nine to 13 kilometers of which is grounded. That is faster than any known tidewater glacier retreat that we could find in the literature. For example, Columbia Glacier is one of the poster childs of rapid retreat, and it retreated about a kilometer a year. This is an order of magnitude larger or faster than that. So let's skip through some of the images that show us this information. So this is a Landsat image from 2021, right before the fast ice broke out. We have this large area of a floating glacier tongue that's about 300 meters thick, and then this partially grounded area between the orange and the black, and then definitely grounded. This area is a bit disputed, which we can talk about more later. And then after the fast ice broke out, the floating tongue stayed there for about three weeks, and then it also started retreating. So it broke up over the course of another three weeks until April, at which we believe it started calving at its grounding line. And then it stayed stable for about six months until October of last year, in which it started undergoing a crazy rapid retreat. So from October to November, it sorry, October 30th to November 30th, it retreated about four kilometers, and then another several kilometers just over the course of a few weeks. Some of these events happened over the course of three days where up to two kilometers were lost. And then in January, it retreated a bit more, but its retreat started slowing down until about March. At this point, it's still at about this uh, terminus position. It has yet to reinitialize its fast retreat. So what we wanted to look at is, well, how did this happen? And why did it happen? And what does it tell us about other places that could potentially undergo such a retreat? And this is just a summary slide to show the crazy difference between the two time periods of when the fast ice was present to after it was lost and the glacier retreated those 25 kilometers. So another part of that story is the thinning that happened at Hectoria Glacier. Here we have the same data, though ISAT2 as well as Worldview data, but along a track instead of um, those specific boxes. So it lost several uh, meters per year prior to the law, uh, prior to the fast ice, so about two meters. But then after the fast ice was lost, even this upper area of Hectoria started thinning at about 17 meters per year. That's an increase of eightfold. So one of the things that I alluded to at the beginning was this disputed area of whether or not the glacier is grounded in this zone. And that's part of this follow-up research, is looking at the calving morphology and the grounding line. So one of the things that we found in this investigation of the optical imagery was this glacier that was forward -ro forwardly rotated in April of 2022. In this area, you can see that it's falling over on top of itself. And this can only happen really in two ways. Like one, if there's a lot of melt undercutting, melt undercutting which seems like a, a not a very good option because this all happened so fast, there wasn't enough time for it to melt. Also, the water isn't really that warm in this area. The other way it can happen is if it's grounded and you're getting a lot of basal, sh uh, basal stress that's uh, causing it to rotate forward with those increasing velocities and um, friction along the bed. And then the other thing that we saw was a significant transition in calving morphology around that area of where the black line is drawn. So here in this image from March 2019, this is the time period in which Hectoria was losing its floating glacier tongue. And you can see all these giant tabular icebergs that are about a kilometer across in some places. But in October, its morphology is quite different. You see a lot of rotated icebergs as well as this sort of uh, slumping and listric faulting at the area that is potentially grounded. 
So part of my uh, research going forward is to investigate these dynamics a bit more and build uh, build up a repository of evidence for the grounding line, as well as look at um, the um, calving morphology and the thinning and what happened to Hectoria during this time period. So with that said, I know there's a lot going on here, but I want you to take away three main things. One is that the Larson B fast ice broke up due to a combination of factors. It wasn't one culprit, though it was weakened by warm weather. And then there was an open sea ice corridor that allowed a large wave swell with a high peak period to reach the fast ice and break it up. Second is that the tributary glaciers did have an initial dynamic response immediately after the loss of the fast ice. They lost their large, thick floating ice tongues and retreated. They sped up and they thinned. And then lastly, Hectoria Glacier is an exceptional glacier that retreated 25 kilometers, nine to 13 of which is grounded. And that's what I'm exploring further now. So thank you for listening. I would love to talk more about this. You can email me. I'm also gonna be at AGU if anyone's going. Um, I'll be giving probably a pretty similar talk, but there'll be more time for questions and conversation afterwards. Yeah, thank you for your really nice talk about quite a crazy retreat and uh, yeah, especially shocking that it can retreat so fast on on grounded ice, I think. Um, yeah, and uh, with this, we come to the last talk of our of this evening, for me at least evening, um, which is Victor and he is a PhD student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and his research focuses on using remote sensing and field data to study the ice dynamics of Sitline, which is formerly known as Malaspina Glacier um, in Southeast Alaska. And uh, yeah, welcome, Victor. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Hi, everybody, my name is Victor. So uh, I'm part of a research team that for the past few years have been working on the potential retreat of Sitline Glacier and about whether or not it was about to become a tidewater glacier. Uh, just, yeah, as a reminder, some people might know this glacier as Malapin Malaspina Glacier. A uh, sit line is the indigenous Tlingit name of this glacier, which means literally big glacier. And we are trying to, to help acknowledging that this glacier is on Tlingit uh, indigenous land and also trying to give back the name to, to, to this glacier. So as a, uh, as a bit of context, this glacier is situated in Southeast Alaska. It's a Piedmont glacier, meaning that it flows from the mountains and kind of spreads out as a fan, as we can see here on the video. Uh, this lobe is approximately 2,000 square kilometers, and most of it sits below 600 meters of elevation. So it's extremely close to the ocean. The mountains that you can see on the right, for example, that one here, Mount Saint Elias, can go up uh, to more than 5,000 meters. And so this area in particular of Alaska has a lot of warm, um, moist air coming from the Pacific Ocean, bumping into the mountains and just dumping a whole bunch of snow that creates those gigantic glacier systems. Uh, and here that video at the end was just uh, somebody flying in the accumulation area of sit line. So I wanted to give you a bit of context, especially why are we interested in this glacier? Well, in, in the last few years, um, people in the research group uh, noticed that very glacial lakes around the glaciers really started to grow at a, at a faster rate. And knowing that the glacier was really close to the ocean, fairly flat and at low, at low elevation, it looked like a fast retreat was about to happen. And actually, if we look at a Landsat, uh, a Landsat mosaic time lapse, we can see those lakes growing. For example, here in the middle of the image, you see in particular those two lakes that are growing at a very fast rate and that one here knowing into the ice. Uh, as a side note, the interesting thing about sit line is that this band of vegetation here actually has ice below it. Not everywhere, but a lot of this vegetation, a lot of that forest is growing on top of the ice. So, when you look at the glacier from up top, uh, there's actually more than meets the eye. Uh, even though the ice looks fairly flat, if you look at the bed of the glacier, it has a pretty complex structure with deep troughs and, and, and almost canyon-like. 
So most of the bed, and this is work from Brendan Tober, I uh, published a paper in 2023 uh, from ice, Operation Ice Bridge data, most of the bed of the glacier sits below sea level. And we think that if there is seawater intrusion coming from here at the south of the glacier, there's basically nothing stopping that water from intruding far into the lobe and really enhancing basal melt from that warm ocean water. And if we trace approximately the position of the ice along the glacier, we can see that here it's far away from, and further from the ocean, but it's extremely close here on the southern part of the, of, of the glacier. That ice is almost touching the ocean. If we take all the ice that is in the lobe only, not the entirety of the glacier, but just the lobe, we have approximately 700 cubic kilometers of ice, so 8 to 10 times the amount of ice in the European Alpine glaciers. If you put that in a cube, it's pretty big. It's eight by eight kilometers. And here the tiny speck is uh, the Eiffel Tower. Um, Sitline is a lobe that can be divided into its three, its three uh, minor lobes that are all uh, uh, due to the tributary. So Sitline is fed by three main glaciers, the Agassiz, the Seward, and the Marvin glaciers. And they all experience uh, similar events. For example, surges that happen sometimes coincidentally, sometimes not. Uh, they differ in magnitude. And the interesting thing is that when surges happen at the same time, you, there's this coordination of even that can of create a super surge where the ice grows much faster than usual and reaches the outreach of the low, uh, the outskirts of the low, like we can see on those uh, images here. So. Um, so far, we have a Piedmont glacier with a surge history, ice sitting close to the ocean, and also a bowl-shaped bed that could allow seawater intrusion far into the glacier. And if you take all those elements, that's kind of the ideal ingredients to create a tidewater glacier. So it's interesting to see how this glacier would retreat and if it would take that shape. For that, we need understanding of our data, but also models. And people in the group have been working on that. Some have already published papers, and there's a lot of work still ongoing. So Sitlane is a really big glacier. Uh, it also has a lot of data, specifically from remote sensing. And we have to try to organize all of that. Uh, we want ice velocity history, ice elevation history, and ice thickness history in order to calculate the climatic mass balance history of this glacier and see how it might evolve in the, in the next decades. Uh, and because we need to organize this data, we can put it together in data cubes, which are very convenient uh, formats to work with. I'm going to illustrate that with uh, some data cubes that we have uh, generated. For example, the DEMs. If you take all the DEM sources that we have for this glacier, it's actually quite a lot. So we have first to uh, co-register them, meaning that we align all those DEMs with each other to reduce the errors. And once we have done that, we put everything into a data cube. We stack the DMs on top of each other. And that's very convenient because those data cubes eventually end up with having the same reference and the same resolution. So we can use very strong data analysis tools for that. Now, if you look at the velocity data cube, we use, we use its life data. And I'm gonna do a bit of advertisement for the its life tool uh, package project. Uh, this is a project with Emma Marshall from the University of Utah and myself and some collaborators that allows you to download easily its left data and correct some errors uh, that are inherent to the data sets. And some of it actually has to do with how its life uh, attributes measurement values. So for example, its life will give you uh, points for a specific time, but we know that actually those measurements are average velocities between two dates that correspond to the two images used to generate the displacement uh, observed on that period of time. And if you look at all those images, all those uh, periods of time, they kind of overlap. So there's actually more data than just what you would get from strictly downloading the data set from its life. And if you look at all these overlaps, but what we can do is an inversion. We can invert the velocities, meaning that we calculate the function that is going to fit all those observations the best way possible uh, by taking account of the respective weights, how long they last for, and we put everything on a regular time scale. Once we have that, we stack everything into a data cube like we did for the DMs. And once you have two data cubes or more, it's actually pretty easy to then use all of that uh, same data analysis tools. Uh, and also it's a better, it's, it's much easier if you are, if you'd want to do some data assimilation or use that into a model. 
So let's do a bit of data analysis. And first, we're going to we're going to uh, start looking at the ice that actually enters Sitline slope. So here on the left, we are uh, we, we we trace the flux gate for each of the tributaries uh, that compose the Sitline. And the figure on the right represents uh, the, the represents uh, the profile of the flux at these flux gates. The higher this curve is, and the higher the flux is through that gate, and that's kind of typical of a valley glacier, you would expect the flux uh, to be maximum in its at the center line of the glacier, it is to be departed to the left, um, and kind of have a ball-shaped curve. Here, for the Marvin tributary uh, to the east of the glacier, we also had that uh, bell curve shaped, and that's the thing, the same thing with the sewer tributary, which is the main tributary of Sitlang. But if you look at that flux of the fluxes uh, where you have the terminus, it's actually very interesting because it's completely different. You have a major spike here. That means that most of the flux goes through that point here on the lower left corner. And then you have a few other spikes that actually correspond to the area where the lakes are growing very fast. So that really represents the heterogeneity of how the ice reaches the terminus and it doesn't go actually everywhere. And if we look at the at the fluxes in time for the for the entire glacier, uh, we see that the sewer tributary brings 90% of the ice into that lobe. The other thing is that, I don't know if you can see on this image, but the flux, the, the ice is kind of flowing from east to west. And that's a very uh, weird pattern about the sewer in particular, is that the surges are completely directional and can really impact an entire area of the lobe without touching the other. And that's what happened in 2021. We had uh, a major surge that went straight through the lobe and spearheaded through that area here in particular. And if we look at the um, fluxes calculated for the terminus area, so that red line, we see that one surge is capable of resupplying, uh, is capable of bringing as much ice as 10 years of quiescent flow. So in one event, you can resupply a lot of ice in a particular area of the glacier. Now let's take a look at a small uh, DM difference between 2022 and 2002. Uh, red represents thinning and blue represents thickening. And we're gonna focus particularly into those forelands where we expect the glacier might start its retreat. The very uh, prominent signal here is, for example, those, that surge signal that shows a bit of blue at the surge front, meaning that in 20 years, even though this area is actually melting a lot, the surge is still capable of bringing more ice than it actually melts. Um, if we look at the debris covered ice, that's that part that is extremely uh, thinning at a very high rate. Um, and those moraines of, that are on the glacier are actually migrating south and stacking here where you have an almost uh, a homogeneous uh, uh, debris cover. And finally, in the forelands, so that's where the vegetation is growing on top of the ice, well, we have almost no thinning in, tw thinning in 20 years less than a meter over 20 years of thinning. And the only strong signals are really those lakes that are prograding into this, this foreland. So the forelands are fairly stable. I just wanted to show also a small picture about, uh, a very fast picture about uh, how the lakes on these forelands tend to grow, but some of them are actually kind of stalling right now, especially that one backdoor lake that is that progression uh, has stopped, but that lake here is actually progressing much faster nowadays. So some lakes are stalling, but overall there are many, many lakes and, and thermocasts that are being created. Here is a, a, an animation uh, from Doug Brinkerhoff, this is model of uh, the, the forecasted retreat of Sitline. And what you have on the right column is the retreat with calving mechanism, model with calving mechanism. On the left column, you have no calving. The top row, uh, you have a constant surface mass balance from the data that we have. And the bottom row is that same mass balance, but with a linear trend increasing to kind of represent uh, global warming in that area. And what we have is that around 2040 is when the glacier really starts to retreat. And that retreat is going to happen in the east and from the south. And it's going to go on, it's going to go on, and of course, it's going to retreat faster in the calving and surface mass balance uh, with linear trend scenarios. And by 
2200, most of the lobe is gone. So today's flux really can knock sus sustain the lobe shape as it is today. But those surges that we saw uh, earlier are very important to bring guys where the uh, glacier might retreat. So is sit line getting cold feet about becoming a tight water glacier? But it's a complicated question because if we look at just the legs, it seems a bit obvious that yes, it's eventually gonna get there. But at the same time, uh, surge is already able to bring ice and maybe counteract this leg growth if the surge is directed at the right place at the right time. And an important thing also is that there's a major isostatic rebound of lift in the area, 12 to 16 millimeter per year. And because the lakes are already at sea level, if it lifts enough, well, the ocean might not be able to bring seawater into those peri-glacial lakes and therefore there might not be a lot of seawater intrusion from there. And finally, the forelands are really resilient. They are melting at an extremely slow rate. And that's the funny thing about Maspina. It might become a sit line, sorry. It might become a tidewater glacier, but with a freshwater lake in the front of it, the forelands, and then the ocean. So there are multiple scenarios under which it could become tidewater. There are a few next steps I'm going to glance over very quickly, but we have more DMs that we can analyze. We can improve our algorithm to uh, invert for the velocities. And finally, that's like a, a ideal case of machine learning application where we might be able to understand of, of underlying mechanisms that uh, we do not see at first glance. So I just wanted to uh, thank everybody who's been working on this project, um, the Glacier Group at UAF, who's been very supportive and uh, everybody who's worked on that. And I also wanted to give a small shout out uh, to the Glaciology Summer School that is reopening for 2024. Naomi and I were there in 2022 and that was definitely a highlight of my PhD. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for a really nice talk with really nice illustrations. And yeah, also thank you for everybody again. And now uh, we come to the questions. And uh, yeah, so we have questions for, um, like a session for questions for everybody at the same time. Mm, I see there's some in the chat. We got it. Yeah. So if anybody wants to speak up, uh, maybe lift your hand, otherwise um, I, there are uh, already two questions, three actually, in the chat. If you look yeah. at that, first one is for Jennifer. Yeah, yeah, I will read it out. Um, mm -hmm. So the first question is by Ian Evans, and um, he asks, does a stable lake imply no basal melting anywhere in its catchment and equilibrium between its water and overlying ice? Uh, yeah, thanks, Ian. Good question. <laughs> I think I've mainly been looking at... Uh active subglacial lakes rather than stable but I think yeah either maybe it could imply you no know, or very limited basal melting and equilibrium but it could maybe also imply that the same amount of water is draining into the lake as there is draining out of it so that the inflow and outflow are balanced um I think that as far as I know, that some work that's been done on some of the like larger stable so glacial lakes in Antarctica, like Lake Ellsworth and other ones, I think have generally said that basal mount rates are pretty low. Um, I'm not not sure of numbers off the top of my head, but um, yeah, that's hopefully that answers your question partly. <laughs> um, oh, uh, 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 yes, yeah. uh, thank you. So, so stable doesn't mean. Um no outflow um so stable is sort of connected in a way to a different sort of activity yeah i think so i don't think it don't think it necessarily means no outflow at all i think it just means more as i understand that balance inflow and outflow um, right, thank you very much but not, okay. yeah yeah okay and then there are two more questions for jennifer in the chat um, the first one is when measuring the vertical displacement of the ice sheet surface to detect subglacial lakes, how do you tease out the seasonal surface elevation change due to seasonal melt? Also a good question. Thanks, Kelly. Um, let me think about that for a minute. I think 
Yeah, seasonal melt signal is an interesting one to think about. Um, I guess, well, for us, at least, like, with the example I showed in the, in the Lazarus ice shelf or just inland from there, um, it's not something I've thought about yet at the moment, just when looking at the analysis we've done with the ISAT2 data, but I guess um, surface melt, I think in that region is the surface melt rates are not so high, I think. And at least I know you don't get very extensive like surface melt water ponding, for example, as superglacial lakes, um, not that far inland and even on the ice shelf itself. In that part of John Ingold land, it's not very extensive. Um, so perhaps it's not like a, as an important component. Um, but yes, yeah, I'd have to think about that in more detail for but it would probably be more of an important consideration of the locations, for sure. Um, the second question you had was, what is um, the smallest is this... lake area? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, what is the smallest lake area that you can detect using this method? Um, I'm not sure if, uh, if, I'm assuming that you're referring to ISAT2, satellite altimetry, rather than like uh, Sentinel-1. Um, I guess, well, ideally, the, the the more number, the greater number of uh, intersecting tracks you can have over an area, the better, because then you can uh, get more of a spatial picture. If you are seeing uh, elevation anomalies in the tracks and there's 60 meters between each point, if you've got more overlapping tracks, then you can get a picture of the whole lake, as it were. Otherwise, if you've just got one track with a, a small, it could be, uh, there could be lots of, Re lots of other reasons aside from subglacial lake presence that might be causing the elevation anomalies. So I guess it kind of depends on that really. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Yeah, Roger has one. Uh, hello, and yeah, first of all, thanks to all the speakers. I, I, I missed whether you're all still PhD candidates or whether you've passed, but if you're, if you're candidates, good luck, and if you've passed, congratulations. Um, question for Naomi, actually. You, you were talking about the, the swell being obviously a primary um, cause of what you've seen. The, if I understand oceanography reasonably well, the swell's very directional. Does does that have anything to to say about the the, the mechanics of how these um, how the ice might break up? You had a lot of fractures, for example, shown in those pictures, and they they were very orientated, and different fractures yeah. will respond differently for different applied stresses. Yeah, so I'm kind of kind of thinking of two things. One being we didn't go into the details of the stress and strain related to the direction of the swell, but more of a general, like, is the swell coming from the corridor? Because if it was coming from a different direction, then it wouldn't have the ability to, like, go through the fast ice. So in that regard, we looked at the wave direction to make sure it aligned with our theory of the corridor, but we didn't go into the fracture mechanics and the stress and strain of it. Sure. I mean, it, it's a compelling correlation and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to knock it over. It's just the kind of, uh, you know, awkward question some reviewer might ask. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. The reviewers didn't ask that, but <laughs> I, I mean, I think there's a lot that could be done more with that part of the research. Like one of the things we were looking at was the CSER or would like to look at would be the sea surface slope and if that played a role yeah. in how the fast ice was breaking up as well and if there was some sort of cyclone event that was occurring in the Atlantic that could have caused the swells so there's of mm -hmm. course the answer is always there could be more research yeah, there could be more yeah <laughs> yeah sure I mean the reviewers probably didn't ask it because you had a, a intelligent specialist reviewers rather than letting a, a, a seismologist into a <laughs> to ask questions but yeah thanks very much and, and, and good luck with it all and thanks it, no, i it, appreciate it, the question if i may i also have one for jennifer if it's okay to 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 carry on yeah sure go ahead um 
again, excuse the naive question, but I have in mind very much the the very interesting but perhaps controversial talk in this series a few weeks ago from Siobhan Killingbeck, um, wondering about whether or not some of these uh, presumed glacial lakes really are glacial lakes based on surface evidence, sur surface geophysical evidence. Are there examples of these um, topographic rises and then depressions actually being ground truthed as, as definitely subglacial lakes? And is there anything else that could cause those uplifts and then, and then collapses? Yeah, really good questions. Uh, I guess there's kind of two parts to that. Um, yes, I think there, there has been evidence, uh, like, uh, yeah, there has been work that's, I think, verified uh, lake, like potential lake locations that have been detected from altimetry and then verified using radar, for example. But then, like uh, you pointed to in the second part of your question, I, there are other things, of course, that can... Uh, cause uh, ice surface elevation change and then the elevation anomalies in the altimetry that then might not necessarily be um, subglacial lake related. Um, like for example, if you've got uh, very, uh, in areas of uh, high ice velocity and you've got the ice deforming and then crevasses forming and things like that, then that can uh, appear as ice surface anomalies or also even, you know, large uh, snowfall, blowing snow, or things like that, and also um, super glacial lakes, so like surface meltwater lakes. Um, which, yeah, in in the region that I talked about, um, melt, surface meltwater lakes wouldn't be uh, an issue, but um, things like blowing snow and surface melting probably something to think about. Um, so I think it's yeah, it can be quite a complicated picture, <laughs> and I think uh, there have been lots of locations around Antarctica that are have been highlighted as, I guess, potential subglacial lake locations or likely subglacial lake locations. But what would be really great is to be able to um, get radar data over all of those locations to sort of say either way would be a bit more certain. Well, we've got some spare radar kit. If you're not doing anything next weekend, I'm sure you can pop out and do it. <laughs> yeah, That'd good luck. With it. Thanks very much. <laughs> Okay, are there any more questions? Ian, can you see the response from Roland to you on the uh, chat? Yeah, yes, that's a very good. Thank you very much, very relevant. And uh, I was just about to thank you in the chat, thank you. Roland, do you have, uh, or you just, you uh, wrote the reply, okay. Um, yeah, I, I just responded to Ian. Um, these really big lakes, uh, you know, people actually do um, hydrodynamic circulation models of, of what's going on, because in particular, if you've got a base of a lake, is is not necessarily horizontal due to the fact that it's brought there by the ice flow. Uh, and then you can have uh, melting and freezing. And the other interesting catch is, is for very deep lakes like Vostok, um, the uh, circulation is different to the, what it would be in a freshwater lake because of the, uh, the extreme pressure at uh, 3,000 metres depth. The uh, situation of a freshwater lake where the densest water is at uh, four degrees is no longer applicable. So uh, the circulation is quite interesting and you can get a, a melting and freezing in different locations and uh, quite, quite deep convection in, in the lake. And of course, the lid of the lake can replace what you've melted away by, by transporting fresh ice from the Grounded surroundings out into the lake, and so that adds to the the potential to not simply melt it all until it's flat, which you mm. might might expect in a very stagnant area. Mm. Great, thank you. Okay, are there any more questions? 
Um, yeah, maybe then I ask, uh, I have a question for Victor. Um, I'm still, uh, I'm trying to get my head around this very fast, fast flow through SID line. Um, how, how does that happen? Is there like a subglacial uh, river going at this location or what, what are the, what's the configuration there? You mean for the, when the ice is going really fast? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so that's the funny thing with the bed is like you know even though the surface is pretty flat, the bed has its drafts. Like whenever the glacier retreats, that's going to be fjord. And exactly where one of the surge keeps happening and be directed towards who is following pretty much that draft, the deepest one that we have. But also sometimes it goes in a place that is fairly non-deep necessarily on the bed. Because all of it has to do at where the ice is flowing when the glacier, when the ice enters the low. And so if the ice is flowing east, then it's very likely the surge is going to go east. And that's why we have on the record is that we know where the ice is flowing. And when a surge happens, it just follows through. It doesn't even change direction. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and, and the, the uh, like how, in which direction it flows, it just depends on. The current configuration of where it flowed last, like it's just switching left and right. Yeah, and it's a kind of complicated mechanism. There's a, an old paper from the from 1964 where there was a, a Swedish researcher who made like a, a wax model of 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 seat line, but without surges or anything. Just put it in a centrifuge and a machine and. It turns out that without any search mechanism, just by kind of replicating gravity flow with the centrifuge, you create that alternance of flow and it manages to create the exact same moraine patterns that we have on the glacier. Interesting uh, thing also is that if you, if you quantify that swing of, of flow direction from east to west, it seems that it's kind of building up throughout the year and consistently at the start of the melt season in April, it switches back to another direction. Mm -hmm. So there might be some there might be some hydrological components there, but also just the fact that that's that's probably how, what how a fluid behaves and how a viscous fluid behaves on its own, just changing direction due to whatever. It's a complicated question. But a fascinating one. Yeah, probably it is. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, so are there any last questions? Otherwise, we are already past 11 p.m. for me. Um, yeah, just people thanking everybody, and I uh, yeah can only repeat this. Thank you for three really nice talks, and. Um, yeah, uh, before uh, everybody leaves, leaves, I also invite you for next week's seminar, which is given by Lynn Kalutsiansky. And she um, talks about glacier seal interactions in Glacier Bay or on the recent outburst flood at Mendehall Glacier. And uh, yeah, with this, thank you everybody for listening and for presenting and see you next week, hopefully. Thanks for organizing. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.